Okay, recording in progress. That means that we are here. And it looks like I have, you guys are coming into the room. I'm so glad you're there. I had said last week I wasn't gonna be doing a show today. So I didn't know if maybe you made other plans, but here you are, my class is showing up. Um, so you're all gonna get credit for this, um, for att attendance credit for today. Um, Glad to see you're coming in and uh, let me just make sure everything's, I just kind of screeched in, sat down at my desk and make sure everything is hunky-dory here. Uh, I think you can hear me okay. If somebody can't hear me, uh, send me a chat. Um, but anyway, it is April 20th, Saturday, April 20th at noon Eastern uh, Eastern time here in the United States and I'm going to be talking about health today as I always do but I've been kind of teasing about this new book I've been reading well, I don't know how new the book is I mean it's not an old book by any means but uh, let's see it was well 2013 I guess that is like over 10 years old but that's not like an old book it's not like a tale of two cities or anything like that right so uh, in any case um Death by calcium. And so we've talked a lot about magnesium. We've talked a lot about um, problems with uh, calcification of the arteries, um, how, how calcium deposits in the soft, soft tissues can be so detrimental. And yet we have um, an epidemic of osteoporosis with a lot of healthcare providers recommending calcium supplementation. So kind of getting to the end of that. And I was really excited to uh, be able to do this program today because it's, it's an exciting topic in my opinion. So anyway, I am Rebecca, uh, Becky Montrone. We have a business here in Keene, New Hampshire called Wonders Roots. I am the practitioner. So I have a degree in holistic nutrition, but I also am an herbalist. So we make, um, well, I make a come up with I have a, far, a compound pharmacy background in my DNA and in my um, family history, and so always uh, thinking about things that we can make to um, better uh, people's health. And I'm um, going to tell you a little update about that in a second. Okay, so uh, anyway, our number here is 603-439-2603. You can reach out to me from either of our websites, wondersroots.org or shopwondersroots.com. And uh, we have a whole line of um, supplements that we make ourselves and then a bunch of supplements that I stock for my clients and for the general public. And you can find those things also on shopwondersroots.com, which you can get to through wondersroots.org as well. Um, we're open here with open shop hours, 9.30 to 5, Monday through Friday, up on the third floor of the Miller Forge building on Roxbury Street in Keene, which is wonderful. It's downtown Keene, but we have a lot of free parking. We have elevator access and um, ha complete handicap access and everything to this building and to where we are even on the third floor. So um, come on up and say hello. Um, and we'd love to meet you. I do wanna say, I meet with clients in private consultation and a lot of you who attend my webinars uh, are those clients, among those clients. And, um, and so I see people here in the office uh, in person. I also meet with them like this um, via Zoom, via teleconference. Somebody said to me yesterday, a client, um, oh, you can do that. That was one of the good things that came out of COVID. And I said, oh no, gosh, I was doing this years before that. I have many clients across the country, out of the country, I will never meet in person. Um, and so this, this works just fine. Of course, back in the day, it was Skype, right? I mean, things have advanced, but um, uh, that said, now I do want to say this. Um, I am always about 90 appointments out and I'm booking right now into June, mid-June. So just so you know that, I'm not trying to sound hard to get, but a lot of times people are like, you know, can I see you, um, you know, within a few days? Do you have any time like on Thursday? I'm like, oh gosh, no. Um, so please understand that. If you're thinking about working with me and you want to um, schedule an appointment, the sooner you schedule it, the better, because I really do do my best to kind of inconvenience myself to be able to see as many people as I can, but um, there's a limit. I just can't, uh, I can't create more hours in the day. So just a heads up there. Um, okay, so I think that's all I say by way of introduction. I do wanna tell you, I was talking about this, um, making things, right, for different health problems. So this is um, my MSM eye drop, but 
And a lot of you use these MSM eye, eye drops and, and you know all about them. I've been doing them for a long time. So MSM is organic sulfur and it works very well in the eyes to restore the collagen synthesis, the natural collagen structure of the eyes so that you can, um, so that you can, uh, your, your, your toxins can release, preventing the buildup of cataracts, things like that. You can have, um, uh, a, a great anti-inflammatory effect, you know, which combats like macular degeneration, uh, glaucoma, the pressure in the eye is able to release. So we see like really great eye benefits with the MSM eye drops, but I have a new client from a couple of weeks ago who has a, a health problem called, um, it's a genetic health problem called um, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. So it's a rare disorder. And um, one of the problems that it, it has that comes with it is, um, is skin problems. The, all these little like skin, like bumps and things in the skin. But another big problem that comes with it is uh, that the retina become calcified and the person goes blind. And um, my client is legally blind. And um, so I'm thinking, calcification, you know, magnesium. We talked about that a few weeks ago. What do we use for calcification to, to, to dissolve calcium deposit? We use magnesium. Magnesium is a calcium channel blocker. So it prevents the calcium channels from being open too long and the calcium flooding in and destroying things. Um, I'm going to be talking about that a lot today on this topic um, that, I'm, that I'm getting to. But anyway, I thought, what if we put magnesium directly in the eye. So then I have to worry about, can you put magnesium directly in the eye? I can't just have people, you know, just say here, put magnesium in your eye, um, unless I do some research, right? So I found that they did use, um, magnesium has been used in ophthalmic solutions. Uh, one, by using it to, um, to, oh, I gotta tell you, if you wanna participate, you can type into the chat down wherever it is on the screen you're using. Mine is at the bottom bar. Um, you can type into the Q and A, or you can raise your hand and I will call on you and then you can speak. So, and I welcome you to do that. And you don't have to talk to me about whatever we're talking about right now. Okay. So, um, so I found that it had been used magnesium chloride hexahydrate, uh, in like a saline solution to help with the ferning of the saline solution. So I'm like, okay, so you can stick it in your eye. And I did want to know like what form. So I have magnesium chloride, but I don't want to put magnesium chloride liquid in here, right? Why? Because water grows bacteria. And what's the big problem with ophthalmic solutions is that they can grow bacteria and cause problems, which is why we've seen a lot of eye drops getting recalled. Um, and, and so we don't want anything that can possibly do that. And so I ordered the powder and I added it to the eye drop. Now, liked it. I put it in my, of course, I would never have it, anybody put anything in their eye unless I did it myself. And it felt fine. It felt a little stingier than the regular MSM eye drops. So um, took it home. I sent uh, a bottle to my client. I am very excited about this. I'm just like the MSM alone, but, and magnesium, we're obviously flooding her with magnesium orally. Now, oh, this is what I found out about this condition was they had studied magnesium for the treatment of this pseudoxanthoma elasticum and found that um, it was very helpful or it was helpful. I, don't, I can't say very, I can't even remember, but it was, they found it had efficacy when it came to the skin things, but no impact on the eyes. But you are my magnesium students, those of you who've been following me lately, they were using magnesium oxide. Mag magnesium oxide is that cheap form of magnesium that causes people will take as a natural laxative, right? Because it doesn't get into the cells of the body. So it stays in the body and it goes into the colon as you're going through, it's going through your digestive tract and it attracts water from the body into the colon. And in so doing, it loosens your stools. And that's great if you have hard stool. And it's not medicational and it doesn't have any, you know, poly whatever like Miralax has or Colace or things like that. So that's wonderful. But you're not getting any magnesium to speak of into your body. 
2% of magnesium oxide is absorbed into the body. And then you've got the problem of the blood brain barrier when you're getting up into these structures of, well, of course the eyes, okay, the visual problems that people have affect the brain, right? Because the retina are attached to the brain. It's all about, you're taking in light and whatnot through your eyes, but it's your brain that interprets it, which means my client has another problem, which are these hallucinations that she gets because of the way her brain interprets um, visual and hallucinations. Well, I guess, yeah, hallucinations that she gets. It, anyway, it's quite, it's quite cool. It's not cool. It's quite fascinating. But what's quite cool is um, she was having a rash of these hallucinations. And in the two days that she had started using the supplement program I put her on, there were no hallucinations. Um, so I don't know if that was coincidental. I don't know. I, I could, I don't know. They could be back full blown. But anyway, this is my story of, of this and how exciting this is. Do you see how this is so exciting for me? Because we see a problem and we see what, what is going on behind the scenes. Your retina are becoming calcified. What do we do for calcification? Magnesium is a big one. So anyway, um, making the drops. I made the drops. So then I had Mary try the drops. And she said, yeah, they, they're a little bit more stingy, but feels fine, feels good. So then she said that night she went home, they felt a little more stingy. So anyway, I felt that they were a little more stingy and peep, that might kind of put people off. Oh, one of you who's out there in the classroom right now has them. So um, you'll have to get back to me about how you feel about them. But anyway, what I did was I had made a bunch of them. We had made a bunch of them. And I yesterday I had Mary throw them all away and start fresh. And I decreased the amount of magnesium. So I haven't tried them yet. I'm going to try them right now with you all watching. Let's see what I think. Oh, yeah, that's very nice. Very nice. It doesn't have that little stingy at all. But it has the kind of stingy that any eye drop would, right? But um, it's fine. And yeah, it's, it's milder. But I know that there's enough magnesium in there to make a difference. To and, and so now she and I and anybody using these, yeah, that, that made a big difference. So I'm pleased with those. That was my first test try on those. Um, and we're making the ones with C. buckthorn, both in the original and with magnesium. We're making the original and the one with magnesium. So you have full, you have full um, choice on what you want to do. But that felt great. No sting at all. That was, that was good. All right. Now, um, so here's the deal. So then I'm looking at, okay, so what can we do to get the magnesium, um, you know, into those tissues that are, are, are higher up? And so I have her using MagMind, magnesium L3 and 8, which crosses the blood brain barrier very easily. I also have her on magnesium glycinate malate. She's getting the magnesium in to her eye. Um, and so, um, what I want to show you is, and I'll go to my website because I've got a really cool diagram. So I found this whole great um, uh, paper, scientific paper on magnesium and the eyes. Uh, uh, eye drops. Bear with me for a second, then I'll show my screen because I found this really cool um, a very interesting, where are we there? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Shrink it down just a little bit. Um, technical stuff going on here. Um, <clears throat> okay. And then I'm gonna share my screen. Do this. Okay, and let's see here, um, screens, entire screen, no, nope. this, all right, share, okay. My chat and my participants where I can see you, that changes when I share my screen, it probably does on yours too, probably have to rearrange some things. Um, like. Anyway, um, so you can see that beautiful diagram, right? 
So um, here I say magnesium or uh, yeah, magnesium is an essential nutrient for the healthy function of many different parts of our body, including the heart, bones, muscles, and nerves. A di low diet of magnesium, a low a low diet of magnesium can cause significant health problems. So it's important to include magnesium rich foods in your diet in order to live a healthy lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. Well, you've heard me say that a million times. Magnesium is especially important in eye health and has been shown to improve the visual field and retinal circulation in patients with glaucoma. Studies with both humans and animals show that a supplement of magnesium greatly improves eye health. And though there have been studies showing these positive effects, further research should be conducted to open up even more therapeutic treatments for eye health through the use of magnesium, right? So we don't have to wait for another study. We could just do it. That's the beauty of, that's the, the joy of being me and being able to do these things and having, just being able to do them and then having you to try them. Okay. You can see in the diagram below that magnesium downregulates inflammation. Here we go. I'll, I'll take us through those. And upregulates antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity within the eye. Look at this. Okay. In addition to making sure you're getting adequate magnesium internally, what better way to directly bathe the eye structures than with a direct application of magnesium to the eye itself? I think it's huge. So possible effect in glaucoma, senile cataract, and diabetic retinopathy. These are, I, I did a program oh, several, a few months ago on the eyes habit, I called it. And you can still see that on my YouTube channel and probably on the Rumble channel as well. Um, talking about the eyes and, and the things that the eyes need. And um, so here we go. Uh, magnesium causes an upregulation of mitochondrial energy, adenosine triphosphate right here, ATP. Um, nitric oxide, uh, oxide synthase three, which now increases glutathione. Okay, I get to say it. Every single program somewhere I get to say glutathione. Superoxide uh, di dismutase, which is, with glutathione, these are like your top body antioxidants and maintains the, um, the sodium and potassium ATPase balance here. Okay, this is magnesium. I am so excited about this. And I think, um, you know, the, the ability to just put these directly to the eye. Um, there's another thing I would love to be able to put into an eye drop, and I can't because I'm not a pharmacist. And because if I was a pharmacist, I would have to have a doctor be willing to write for it. And that's insulin because insulin, um, diabetic insulin delivered through the eye has been shown to actually treat diabetes in the whole body, but also the diabetic problems that come with diabetes and the, the eye problems, the ocular problems that come with diabetes. So um, this is really huge. I think it's, um, it's really wonderful. So I am going to um, stop my share for now. And then I'll end up um, sharing again to, as I get into my topic of the day. It only took me like 20 minutes to get there, but um, we will get there. And uh, we are there. So I'm going to share my screen again. Again, you are welcome to participate in any manner. You can raise your hand. You can chat, type in the chat. You can type in the Q&A. And um, what else did I want to say? I think it is that for now. And then I'm going to share again. So first I have to actually, let's see, open my newsletter. So that will take me just a second. So again, um, very fascinating because if you, if you look at what's really exciting and important is that when we're looking at something that doesn't work for something, like I'm going to be telling you calcium doesn't work for osteoporosis. In fact, it makes osteoporosis worse. And you're like, oh, that's impossible. I mean, with everything we know, right, with everything we've been told and taught, um, that can't possibly be true, we might say. Um, and, yet, uh, and yet it is true. But then it's like, but what do we do? You know, then, then what else can we do? And um, so that's the kind of thing we'll be talking about today, but um, along with. So I am going to share my screen again. Uh, am I there? Share this. Okay. All right, great. Participants in my chat where they belong. I'm set to go. So, um, yeah, you see calcium, and I'm talking here about calcium supplements. Now, I will say right from the get go that um, Thomas Levy, who wrote this book, 
um, death by calcium. He says proof of the toxic effects of dairy and calcium supplements. Now with all respect to Dr. Thomas Levy and with all having like looked at all kinds of different sides of things, um, I don't think you have to avoid calcium foods unless you're eating them excessively, except for the fact that most modern calcium foods are supplemented with vitamin D and vitamin D to help you increase your calcium absorption. But the problem is vitamin D and calcium without vitamin K are a huge problem. So kind of the main problem with your dairy products, your modern day dairy products and eating them in moderation is going to be about vitamin K, but we will get there. Okay. So calcium, if there's one supplement your doctor probably telling is probably telling you, you need it's calcium. I'm going to tell you calcium is one supplement you don't want and you don't need and don't want. Um, okay, so join me and you did and you're here. That's wonderful. So top cal calcium myths. This is really great because you get a book like this and I, I like to read the book and I am reading the book and um, I'm a good way through it. But what I will say is um, there's always, when there's a good book out there, you can always find a lot of good synopsis type information to share in a forum like this. Um, so this is great because I can bring it to you and I can bring it to you with uh, materials that you can click on and have the, without buy, without reading the whole book. Because, you know, seriously, it's not going to a book of this many pages on this topic is probably not what everybody's going to do unless they're somebody like me. Um, so anyway, the top calcium myths, according to Thomas um, E. Levy, MD, uh, JD, calcium is good for you. You need to eat dairy products to get enough calcium. If you have osteoporosis, you have a calcium deficiency. Increased bone density means stronger bones. And when you have osteoporosis, the biggest danger is breaking a bone. And um, so we're going to pop into those, which um, I was able to find. This is great because if you do, if you look, you can find a lot of nice summaries of things. And I found some great resources and they're all in the newsletter too, for you to look at later on. Um, but okay. Okay. Okay, but I think this is, is a good thing to go through. There's just a few points, but I think the expanded version is worth reading through. So I'm going to do that. Um, from childhood on, we've all heard it. Drink your milk. Milk does a body good. You never outgrow your need for milk. And most of us have accepted these truth at face, truths at face value. We know there's a lot of people who don't believe that today who are like, cow, cow's milk is for baby cows. So we hear a lot of that too, which never seemed to make that much sense to me either because a lot of things are for other things and we eat them, but anyway. Um, and most of us have accepted these truths at faith, face value. We know that calcium is necessary in a host of bodily functions and that it builds bones and strong bones and teeth. So after each milk mustache, cup of yogurt or calcium supplement, we mentally pat ourselves on the back for helping stave off osteoporosis and general physical deterioration. If some is good, more must be better, right? Wrong. Thomas E. Levy, MDJD says that not only is our country's commitment to calcium not bringing about the desired benefits? It's actually sabotaging, sabotaging our health. Yes, calcium is essential for bodily function, but as many non-mainstream -ma healthcare practitioners have long known, there's a real and grave danger in pumping excessive amounts of it into our bodies, says Dr. Levy, author of Death by Calcium, blah, 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 blah. Believe it or not, most of the adult population has no need for significant calcium intake and that need rapidly decreases with age, right? We're told the opposite. It's like, if you're a woman over 50, that's when you really need to up your calcium to 1200 milligrams a day. That's what we're told. Here's the really scary part. An excess of calcium reliably promotes heart disease, high blood pressure, strokes, cancer, and other degenerative diseases. So not only are those supplements not helping, they may actually be killing you. Um, and then understandably, most people are shocked to hear this, Dr. Levy concedes. Due to decades of convincing campaigns and marketing ploys, millions have embraced the milk is good for you myth and other related fictions. Okay, um, blah, 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 talks about that. These are the myths. Myth one, calcium is good for you. There's a reason why no one questions the popular wisdom that calcium is good for you. It seems completely plausible. After all, aren't bones largely composed of calcium? Isn't osteoporosis a calcium deficiency of the bone? It makes sense that drinking milk or drowning calcium tablets will fix the problem. What people don't realize is that while osteoporosis involves a lack of calcium in the bones, it does not mean that there is a calcium deficiency in the rest of the body or in the patient's diet. 
explains Dr. Levy. And moving on from osteoporosis, excess calcium promotes a host of other health problems, including heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and virtually all chronic diseases, virtually all chronic diseases. In fact, it increases all cause mortality by 250%. And when you read this book, he's got a great bibliography. He's got studies on all of these. And as a um, practitioner and as a researcher, I, I spend a lot of time when I read books like this, going in and grabbing those studies and adding them to my files. So um, trust me on that. The bottom line is there's no concrete evidence support that calcium delivers any real health benefits, quite the opposite. Now, of course, calcium we, we need, but calcium is not hard for us to get. And calcium is critical and a bazillion functions in the body. So he's not saying we don't need calcium. He's talking about we, calcium supplementation, excess calcium. Make sure, are you getting enough calcium? And I know I've told this story in a couple of times, maybe a couple of times in the past few weeks because I was talking about magnesium and calcium. But my father, when he um, had his pharmacy, would, um, you know, sold supplements. And somebody came, when somebody came in to buy like a calcium supplement, he would have them go to this website on one of his computers and you could put in what you ate in, in a day and see how much calcium you were getting. And then he would say, see, you really don't want this supplement. He could have sold it, but he just said, you don't, you don't want it. Um, you need to, myth two, you need to eat dairy products to get enough calcium. The government's recommended daily allowance is between 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams per day for most adults. Uh, if that's correct, loading your diet with dairy products would be an easy way to reach that goal. However, um, says Dr. Levy, not only is the government's RDA far too high, the idea that you need dairy to get enough calcium is false. Cultures that drink little to no milk have a much lower incidence of osteoporosis than Americans, he shares. Actually, the average person's need for calcium is more than adequately met with a diet that includes meat, eggs, and vegetables. If you want to consume dairy, that's your choice, but don't do so believing that avoiding these products will result in an adequate intake of calcium. Maybe that's the best takeaway from this whole point is because some people will say, I have to take calcium because I don't eat dairy. So I have to. Uh, myth three, if you have osteoporosis, you have a calcium deficiency. Well, that seems to make sense. This statement isn't entirely incorrect. If you have osteoporosis, you do have a calcium deficiency in your bones. Because of this fact, many physicians and their patients believe that the entire body must be depleted of calcium as well. But that's a dangerous assumption. Throughout the rest of your body, it's actually likely that you have an excess of calcium. Um, yeah, and way back um, last year, I would say in the third quarter of the year, I did a program where we talked a lot about the calcium coronary calcium scan. And we talked about vitamin K quite a bit in that program. And um, again, we, are see, we, we see what is a bigger predictor of cardiovascular disease than your cholesterol level is your calcium, your coronary calcium score. So here we have most arterial, arterial plaque is made primarily, its primary constituent is calcium. That's not in the bones. It's in the arteries. Okay. Um, the problem with osteoporosis is that the body is unable to synthesize a new structural bone matrix and integrate calcium into it, an issue that more calcium doesn't even begin to fix, explains Dr. Levy. In fact, much of the calcium leached from the bone simply moves it to other parts of the body where it does you harm. It's both ironic and sad that because of this fundamental misunderstanding, so many motivated health conscious people are sabotaging, sabotaging their health in an effort to improve it. And you might be among them. I mean, it is cl clearly somebody came in um, the other day and asked, uh, do we carry coral calcium? And I said, I don't carry any calcium. Um, and, you know, I sell supplements and I'm like, I don't carry any calcium. Uh, Cause I don't recommend calcium supplementation. And that's shocking to people. It's like, Oh, um, then of course they want to know more. Um, calcium supplements will help prevent broken bones. Um, yes, there are studies that indicate that calcium supplementation is effective in decreasing the incidence of fractures, fractures in osteoporosis patients. But if you look more closely, says Dr. Levy, you'll uncover more questions than answers. Notably, most positive studies also included 800 or more units of vitamin D as a co-supplement. Vitamin D by itself will decrease the chances of osteoporotic fra fracture, and that's not all. 
In some trials, the number of subjects was very small and others duration was short and in still other patients and um, an observer bias wasn't tempered by double blind placebo control, he comments. Plus some studies relied on the accuracy of the, of the subject's self-observation and memory, which is questionable. Could you ac accurately remember how much calcium you've taken over the past 10 years or even one year? Yeah. On the other hand, in Death by Calcium, I cite numerous studies that collectively provide more than enough data to conclude calcium supplementation does not prevent bone fractures. Remember, it's easy for various individuals and organizations to pick and choose the study results they'd like the public to believe, knowing that most people will take that information at face value, he adds. And so he's talking about people with, um, you know, whether it's the dairy industry or the calcium supplement industry, um, people with, um, with vested interests. Myth five, increased bone density means stronger bones. Let's say that you've, you've, you have, I love this in the book, you have a rotting wooden fence bordering your yard. If you paint it with a new coat of bright white paint, it will look better, but the fix is only cosmetic. The fence's underlying structure is still continuing to deteriorate. That's essentially what happens when you use calcium supplements to treat bone density. Your bone density test score may well improve with a bit, a bit with calcium supplementation, but this is not associated with stronger bones or a decreased risk of fracture. When you treat a disease like osteoporosis with increased calcium, the density can legitimately increase, but the quality of the bone itself doesn't improve unless other important factors are addressed, explains Dr. Levy. The structural matrix of the bone still isn't normal and has no greater resistance to fracture than the diseased bone before the new calcium deposition. That's a great analogy, okay? kind of a great figurative um, image of, you know, just painting a, fe a fence that's still rotten on the inside, but it looks, it looks better. Myth six, when you have osteoporosis, the biggest danger is breaking a bone. That's what people think. I have osteoporosis, so I don't want to break a bone. I don't want to break a bone. Well, do you want to have a heart attack? Uh, because they, they, they all go hand in hand because of this calcium, this misappropriation of where the calcium is in the body. So, there's no disputing that when a person with osteoporosis fractures a bone, it's serious business. These fractures often cause incapacitation and other complications that may lead to death. But would you say that sustaining a fracture is more serious than suffering or even dying from a heart attack, stroke, or cancer? These are often the unrecognized consequences of osteoporosis. Um, a groundbreaking study made it very clear that a fracture is not the major concern for a majority of osteoporosis patients says Dr. Levy. It found that in nearly 10,000 postmenopausal women, there was a 60% increase in the risk of death for individuals in the lowest quintile of bone density compared to those in the highest quintile. And most of those deaths did not relate to a fracture. fracture. The likely reason is straightforward. The more advanced the osteoporosis, the more calcium has been released from the bones over time, he explains. This release literally showers all of the other tissues and organs in the body with a chronic excess of calcium, which as I've already pointed out is extremely detrimental to your health. There are many other studies that also support this, the conclusion that one of the biggest dangers of osteoporosis is the fact that it promotes and worsens so many other chronic diseases. So you do have to take care of it. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna talk about how to do that. Uh, we will get there, okay. Um, and then, the myth when people say vitamin D is just there to increase calcium absorption when it comes to the bones. And that's not true either. Vitamin D plays an essential role in regulating and modulating calcium absorption and metabolism via its interactions with the bones, guts, gut, and kidneys. But despite data that has been accumulating since the 1980s regarding the many other roles vitamin D plays, many doctors still approach it as being only another way to supplement calcium. Vitamin D plays a role in the metabolism of virtually all cells in the body, and it is known to have a direct effect on around 200 genes. So it's very important, Dr. Levy shares. However, I strongly caution you not to seek out vitamin D in foods with high calcium content. Again, your calcium fortified milk. I mean, your vitamin D fortified milk. Since vitamin D facilitates and even overdoses calcium absorption, which as we've already covered is not desirable. Um, myth eight, that you can get all the vitamin D you need from the fun, sun, um, which he um, says is not true. Um, but I want to move on. You can look at that final one and look at that, but we're not talking about vitamin D today so much as we are a few other things. So um, let's see here. Um, 
<clears throat> Where do I want to go from here? Oh, yeah. I think I want to go here uh, next because this kind of is a little bit of an overview. But also, the Weston A. Price Foundation, as you well know, is um, they're big on raw milk and they're big on whole foods and cheese and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, it's interesting their take on this book and the person who reviewed it. Excuse me, one second. So, um, so let's go there. I liked um, the beginning paragraphs, which I kind of just uh, put into there anyway. Um, Dr. Tom Thomas, we're going to talk about vitamin C, vi osteoporosis actually being scurvy of the bone, which is a vitamin C deficiency, not a calcium deficiency or a vitamin D deficiency, but a vitamin C deficiency. And it's really cool because in the book, um, what, what he says here about that, I turned right to it. Um, so you have osteoblasts that make bone, right? And then you have osteoclasts and they d dissolve bone. So the osteoclasts are being very active when you're dissolving bone and, and putting that, cal that bone mineral material into the bloodstream and out of the bone. And then the osteoblasts are all about um, putting, the, putting the calcium into the, the minerals, including calcium into the bone. <clears throat> so um, you have to have the right balance there. And it says, um, in the absence of vitamin C, bone-making osteoblasts fail to form. At the same time, since vitamin C impedes the creation of bone-dissolving osteoclasts, a focal scurvy inside the bones will allow them to multiply in an uncontrolled manner, thus initiating the imbalance that results in a detrimental breakdown of the bone integrity, along with calcium loss. So you've got vitamin C is very, and vitamin C affects bone health in other ways, but that is a huge one. So you've got the vitamin C is necessary. So you have adequate osteoblasts and you're not over reproducing the osteoclasts that break the bone, uh, dissolve the bone minerals down and now they exit the bone. Okay, I hope that made sense. Okay, um, <clears throat> both, okay. Dr. Levy explains death, in which he disputes the longstanding beliefs that osteoporosis is caused by a deficiency of calcium and that arteriosclerosis is caused by high levels of cholesterol. Both conditions, he claims, are in fact caused by high levels of calcium. It is not calcium, Dr. Levy claims, but rather vitamin C that is the foundation and cornerstone of strong bones. And osteoporosis is a kind of chronic focal scurvy, focal meaning localized to the bones, that is caused by a lack of vitamin C. Osteoporosis is caused by oxidative stress, he says, and vitamin C is an antioxidant needed in sufficient amounts to combat the stress. That's a second way that um, vitamin C makes a difference in the bones. First, the osteoclast and the osteoblast, right? That balance. But then oxidative stress, free radicals. We talk about that all the time here in antioxidants on this program. Antioxidants and the need for antioxidants to combat oxidative stress. Well, vitamin C is one of your highest antioxidants. And when you don't have antioxidant um, antioxidants, then, uh, then, then the, the free radical damage takes over. So now you've got two reasons there. Um, <clears throat> he says, and vitamin C is an antioxidant needed in sufficient amounts to combat that oxidative stress. A large part of the book discusses vitamin C, how to take it, how to administer it, varieties of vitamin C and why it is a superior nutrient. However, his recommendations include only supplemental forms of vitamin C. There are no, there is no discussion of natural forms. And he will tell you that diet, that's because he comes right out and says diet, vitamin, dietary vitamin C will not be enough. Um, vitamin C is essential for the synth synthesis of collagen, which makes up 90% of the organic matrix of the bone. But in studies where vitamin C supplements um, are given to prevent or heal fractures or bone loss. The results are not consistent. Some studies show a benefit while others do not. But this is the, the deal. This is what he recommends, 6,000 to 15,000 milligrams of vitamin C of any kind per day in divided doses. Or in the case of those who may experience watery diarrhea from taking those doses, 2,000 milligrams per day of liposomal vitamin C, which is generally well tolerated. Um, and you can break that up into doses. And I talked about that when I did my program on vitamin C. Um, 
He also recommends supplementing with vitamin D3 and K2, which direct calcium into the bones and away from the heart and other organs. But now space pays special heed to vitamin K2 and rightfully so. Research shows that calcification can be reversed in blood vessels, kidney stones, and coronary arteries with appropriate intake of vitamin K2, especially the MK4 4 form. He also recommends that magnesium intake from supplements be sufficient and that magnesium glycinate be taken with every serving of dairy food to combat its purported artery clogging properties. So there we go with the magnesium. Dr. Levy regards magnesium as a calcium channel blocker, which it is, again, blocking, stopping the cha calcium channels from remaining open too long and allowing calcium to flood in, destroying um, cells and wreaking havoc in the body. Um, research shows an association between low serum magnesium and coronary artery calcification. Okay. Um, so anyway, then they get into their kind of thing about if you want to read about that, about um, about calcium supplements and dairy foods and, and whatnot. And again, my feeling is my professional fe feeling, uh, opinion, is dairy foods in moderation, like all foods except horrible processed junk food in moderation, right? So um but again, you've got to be careful because out there you've got a lot of um, you've got a lot of of um, vitamin D fortified dairy foods to make sure you get that calcium, and there's no K. So, all right, now I want to go to this is a great um, overview here of the book. I think that this is fantastic, and I was so glad that I found it. This is from orthomolecular.org. Orthomolecular.org is um, started out, um, think of Linus Pauling, the vitamin C normal Nobel laureate, laureate. So um, it's really will focus on anything that involves vitamin C, but um, be, it goes beyond that as, as well. But you can see why this would fit nicely in that. Um, or they do a lot of other things besides vitamin C, but it sort of started out that way um, when it first began orthomolecular medicine. Um, so we've been through all of that. Now, here, let's go through these things, these points on these things that help, um, right? So it's not calcium. We've just said it's not calcium supplements and it's not too much, you know, drink more milk, or any of that. Vitamin C and osteoporosis. Increased oxidative stress equals an inflammatory response in the bone is accompanied by an increase in C-reactive protein. So CRP, they, they measure your CRP level as a means of detecting your cardiovascular risk um, assessment as part of that whole thing because it shows inflammation in the area of like the arteries. The level of C-reactive protein can accurately, accur accurately predict fra fracture risk in older women with osteoporosis. Interesting, because that's not what it's typ typically, it's used as, as what I just said. But see, see the way they go together the osteoporotic fra fracture risk and the art, the cardiovascular health risk. Increases in other inflammatory markers are also in cl closely associated with increased fracture risk. <clears throat> high dose vitamin C, high dose vitamin C. So not, I have a glass of orange juice every day fortified with calcium, Becky. Um, <clears throat> no. Can significantly reduce C-reactive protein and many other markers of inflammation. And again, what I love about this paper is you can go here. It said it to go to um, there and see. Do you see all those studies you can pull up? So if you want to just, you know, you can just run with it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Vitamin C stimulates the development of osteoblasts. We just talked about that. Vitamin C is necessary for the synthesis of pro progen in class three, which is required for the growth of osteoblasts. The ones that make bone, the blasting ones, osteo cells, dietary vitamin C, which is negligible con compared to the level provided by, by vitamin C supplementation does not reduce fracture risk. And that's what that reviewer in Western A. Price missed, that he does have that in the book, dietary vitamin. She said that she thought the book was too long and boring, but I don't find it that way. Um, that's what she says at the end. Anyway, um, dietary vitamin C, which is negligible compared to the level provided by vitamin C supplementation. And everybody's still with me. So obviously you're not bored. 
um, does not <clears throat> reduce fracture risk. Um, elderly osteoporosis patients with a history of fractures had significant had significantly lower levels of vitamin C than those without a history of fractures. You have to make an effort to get the vitamin C. You're not going to get it in your diet, not to do what we're trying to do here. Do you see, again, like when I was doing that series, I started uh, maybe a year and a half ago when I was doing the radio thing, the blog radio that I kept having all those technical difficulties with. Oh, thanks for sticking with me through all of that. But um, do you remember uh, we talked about what's missing and I went through all of these nutrients and it just keeps coming back to this, doesn't it? It just keeps coming back all of these modern day health problems, and they could be old health problems too, but they're certainly not diminished in our modern times, any of our chronic diseases. And yet, doesn't it keep coming back to nutrients, things that aren't, we aren't getting, or things that have been disrupted? Like last week, we talked about butyrate and how we're not making enough butyrate, short chain fatty acid, and how that's involved in so many important things within the body. So things that we need to keep going back to the basics, go back to the basics. Um, because um, that's where we really learn and that's how we learn how to protect ourselves. But again, if we're doing the things, if we're doing the C and the K and the D, and we're going to talk about hormones in a little bit and, um, and fatty acids, we are not just helping our bones. I mean, those five things are huge for the bones. They're real help for the bones. But they're also real help for like a bazillion other things when it comes to your health. So it's like, wow, um, that's remarkable. And that's wonderful. And again, that's all about the roots, the wondrous roots. Feed the roots with the right things and all the branches will flourish. Okay, so, um, so the osteoblast. Okay, we got through the blast. Dietary vitamin C, which is negligible compared to the level. Yes, we did. We talked about that. Elderly people. Okay. Supplementation with vitamin C, but not but not calcium, significantly increased bone mineral de density in all increased bone mineral density in all bones, and that's important to see because what that reviewer that um, was published in Western A Price said was that 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 wasn't really very well proven, right? But then you go to this actual study, vitamin C supplement use in bone mineral density in postmenopausal women, women who took vitamin C. Plus calcium and estrogen had the highest BMD at the femoral neck, blah, 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 blah. Vitamin C supplement use appears to have a beneficial effects on levels of bone mineral density. Um, and, but they say, especially among women using concurrent estrogen therapy and calcium supplements, of course, he didn't write that. But um, you get the point that vitamin C definitely is having an effect there. And again, we go back there and then where we were. We're going to get into the hormonal things, which I'm going to boil down to uh, my enthusiasm for DHEA, for bone health, because we get estrogen and testosterone from um, naturally from DHEA. Okay, so um, back here in over, over my okay, so in mice that had their ovaries removed, vitamin C prevents bone loss. So study there. Um, vitamin C significantly accelerates fracture healing. You can find studies there. A study there and, and in an adequate vitamin C level significantly improves the strength of healed fractures. So when people has, have a break or a fracture and they come to me and they ask for help. So vitamin C is all, always one of the big things that we get in there um, for that reason. Vitamin K deficiency. Okay. And osteoporosis, vitamin K. And there's a lot of vitamin D supplementation enthusiasm out there and I'm all for it vitamin D3, but a lot of people are getting D3 and they're not take, they're not getting K. They're not getting K2. And we did, I did talk about that a lot, but anyway, vitamin K inhibits ectopic calcification by activating proteases such as osteocalcin and makes matrix GLA proteins. Vitamin K helps dissolve deposited calcium in organs and arteries. That's kind of says it in a nutshell. Neutralizes warfarin. Warfarin can cause ectopic calcification. So that's another thing. Um, we're getting away from warfarin. Um, doctors tend to be using things like Eliquis um, for, blood thin for blood thinning control for people with atrial fibrillation and things like that, which atrial fibrillation can also be brought back to low magnesium and calcification and all of that too. But the thing about warfarin, Coumadin, is that you can't have vitamin K. 
And so what happens with people on Coumadin? They increase their risk of coronary artery disease because of the calcification of the arteries. It's, it's, not, it's not right. Um, Reduced uh, fracture risk in people with vitamin K improves bone quality. You can find studies there. Again, um, you know, it's just fun to be able to do that and just see, oh, there's no studies on this, they say. There's no studies. These things haven't been studied. Well, yes, they have. They have been studied um, and are being studied. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, bone quality, uh, <clears throat> adequate intake of vitamin K reduces cardiac and all cause mortality. At any dose tried, there is no apparent toxicity. Okay, that's important to know. So vitamin D deficiency and osteoporosis, an inadequate le level of vitamin D ensures that the body gets enough calcium from the diet. The role of vitamin D goes far beyond the metabolism of bone and calcium. Vitamin D regulates about 2000 genes. Deficiency of vitamin D leads to osteoporosis. Too much vitamin D exacerbates osteoporosis. Interesting. During bone growth and development, vitamin D plays an important role in bone density. And therapeutic doses of vitamin D reduced all-cause mortality. So vitamin D is big, and we don't want to throw out our vitamin D. We want to make sure we're getting it. We want to make sure we're using it properly with vitamin K2, but also with um, DHEA, because DHEA and D work together for the bones and as well as the hormonal thing. So I've talked about DHEA a lot here too. Okay, estrogens and osteoporosis. Estrogen reduces coronary calcium de deposition. The higher the E2, the lower the calcium artery uh, content score. Uh, estrogen inhibits a calcification promoting protease. Estrogen deficiency leads to an increase in cytokines that promote inflammation. Reduction of fracture risk in patients with osteoporosis, estrogen deficiency increases all-cause mortality, estrogen deficiency promotes metabolic syndrome. But Becky, I've heard that it's dangerous to, supple to take um, HRT, um, to take estrogen supplements that I could promote cancer and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you don't need to take an estrogen supplement or, or medication or even an estrogen supplement like a, um, an estradiol or estriol. Um, over-the-counter kind of thing, if you're getting DHEA, because DHEA is going to give you both progesterone and estrogen, as well as testosterone. And here we have androgens and osteoporosis, testosterone deficiency, a well-established fracture risk factor. Testosterone has a calcium channel blocking function, like magnesium is a calcium channel blocker. Prostate cancer patients often have low T levels, Testosterone levels are often inversely proportional to coronary calcium index and testosterone deficiency decreases all cause mortality. So um, not, I'm not a proponent of um, testosterone um, injections and things for guys. There's some real concerning things about that. Um, in fact, just had a client in the other day and um, well, I'm not gonna say this cause I, I never know who's listening, um, but um, so I, I'm not gonna go there, but. You don't need to. If you're doing DHEA, which is a pro-hormone made in all of your adrenal glands, I would maintain that's adequate. And we know DHEA itself is huge for the bones. In fact, I can actually just go to my files quickly and pull that up. DHEA. And let's see. Bones. Bone. Let's just go for bone then. Yeah. DHEA improves bone density in women. And this was uh, published in the, um, I think I can just let me do my share. Okay. So I am sharing that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you can see that. And I have another um, piece on that. And so um, in my files, um, let's just go here, overview. Well, those of you who sit in my office, you know I do this all the time. I'm constantly going, oh, here it is. And I'll print this for you. And then you go out with a stack of stuff like this, this thick but good to your bones. Again, osteoporosis and DHEA levels 
Decline with age, osteoporosis may appear. People with osteoporosis have significantly lower DHEA levels than people without the disease. When osteoporotic lab animals are given DHEA, their bones remineralize. That is, their bones become stronger. Uh, um, there we go. So, and it says here, um, bone cells convert DHEA to estrone, a type of estrogen that in turn increases the activity of bone making cells called osteoblasts. So do you see that there? We're taking care of that problem, but we're not using HRT. We're not taking a synthetic estrogen supplement. DHEA is hugely breast cancer, cancer preventive, hugely. Um, whereas estrogen um, HRT prescriptions are breast cancer causative. So the very, very different, very safe. Um, DHEA's transformation into estrone depends on the presence of vitamin D3. Likewise, D3 requires DHEA to stimulate osteoblasts. You see the whole, you see it here? It's very, very fascinating. Um, but again, it just goes to show that it's not hard. Um, so now I've got to go back to this. Okay, where was I here? Overview. And... Yes, okay, I'm sharing that screen now. So, um, sorry, that's probably making you dizzy like it is me. Um, so then the androgens, okay, but we're also getting that from the DHEA. The thyroid hormone and osteoporosis. So thyroid um, is very important. Thyroid balance is very important. We have a lot of thyroid um, disease today because of iodine deficiency. And um, so iodine and selenium, hugely important for all of this. And then consequently for many other areas of health, including um, cardiovascular health. And it could all be through like the same sort of like root, rooty ways, right? Because of the effect of one thing upon another. So thyroid hormones have a significant effect on the metabolism of cells throughout the body. The roles of early skeletal development and high bone mass are essential. Both high and low thyroid function increase fracture risk. TSH has a direct non-thyroid related bone production protecting function. And both too high and too low thyroxine, which is T4, independently increased all cause mortality. This includes subclinical hypothyroidism and subclinical hyperthyroidism. So very important to know that your thyroid is functioning well and um, using nutrients to support thyroid function. Thyroid hormone status should be a part of routine medical examination. It should be checked regularly, at least annually, especially in the elderly population, effective therapy is available. And again, he doesn't get into that. And you know me and the iodine thing and thyroid and selenium, um, very, very important and very lacking. Um, so again, we're in a, we're in a, in a real kerfuffle here in our modern day health uh, picture, because we have so many chronic diseases that are related to these things that are off, like the thyroid and, uh, and like our bones and, our, and mineral deposition, things like that, that are due to things that are fixable at the root level using nutrients um, so many times. And yet uh, we don't get there in mainstream medicine, we get a lot of prescriptions and we don't get, well, what's really going on here? That's the inquisitive mind. That's the, the, the true healthcare practitioner's um, role is to sleuth things out, um, to try to draw logical conclusions and to see what can be found to support those things and then to go on. Um, so I have here um, in the chat, uh, I've always been told to take calcium supplements, but my experience has been that if I do, I get increased joint pain, particularly in my shoulder. It goes away when I stop taking calcium supplements. No brainer. Oh, that's so interesting, Jean. Also want to mention that although I've been diagnosed with osteoarthritis and osteopenia, my bones seem very hard. I've had several severe falls and hard hits on my bones and no breakage. Strong nonetheless. Less. Yeah. And this is what I say, we want to have strong, supple bones, not hard, um, hard, hard bones that are not strong. And there is the whole um, role of, um, well, let me just find that. This is like why I love doing this uh, instead of radio, because um, I can just share stuff and show it to you. But osteoporosis, my osteoporosis files... 
Uh, okay, so this is a very interesting paper and it is what I'm showing on my screen right now. So, um, but I really need to kind of like magnify it. I'm not gonna bother, but I can, I can, um, I can just read it to you. It says, um, recent evidence supports that age related changes in mesenchymal stem cell, including loss of self renewal and increases in senescent cell numbers. That's the number of blah, 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 and vessels. The number of, um, what they're trying to say here is that you need less dense bones to a certain extent in order for the soft tissues to do their jobs. So it says, um, the number of me mesenchymal stem cells and vessels need to be increased to achieve functions similar to those in young people. This requires dissolving a portion of inorganic materials and providing extra space to hold more cells and blood vessels. In contrast, osteo anti-osteoporotic drugs prevent bone destruction and increase mineralization, de increase mineralization that occupies the space of, of organic materials, reduces bone immunity and self-repair. So, that's another whole um, thing to look at uh, in, um, okay, where is my, yes, this is where I was. Um, so again, some loss of bone density is necessary, uh, but it, you've got to have that wonderful balance. And these are the things that we do um, to do that. And so again, uh, a summary here of this summary of the book. Um, healthy, to put uh, these together, we recommend an integrated management of osteoporosis that includes at least the following. And this is um, put together by that orthomolecular society that I'm getting this page from talking about Dr. Levy's book. Sufficient exercise, outdoor activities, relaxation and sleep, Nutrition rich anti inflammatory healthy diets to include low carbohydrates, sufficient proteins, and healthy fats. Minimize processed foods and synthetic food additives, right? Your general healthy diet, agricultural chemicals, antibiotics, and hormones, and other environmental pollutants. Nutrition, in addition to adequate doses of vitamin C, D, E, K2, and magnesium supplements, macro and micronutrients play, a signif play significant roles the prevention and reversal of bone health and osteoporosis as reviewed in 82. We won't go there right now. Broad spectrum, optimal vitamins and micronutrients, especially vitamin C, D, K2, and magnesium, as these nutrients require each other for optimal effects as described in blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we use them all. It's not what well, I'm going to do vitamin C for my bones. And um, you over there, you can do K2 for your bones and you can use DHEA. And another one can use, um, can use vitamin D. Uh, no, it's not that way. It's like everything. And there's also, um, there was also a whole thing about, um, in one of the pieces I had about the e essential fatty acids. Yes, here we go, right here. See that? Okay. Essential fatty acids in osteoporosis. Some essential fatty acids have ca calcium, can't, channel blocking capabilities. So again, preventing that calcium from rushing in and overdoing. Numerous essential fatty acids. So think about your omega-3s, your fish oil, that kind of thing, have been shown to protect bone mineral density. Blood EFA levels are inversely related to all-cause mortality. And um, excess calcium is, is related to all-cause mortality, right? Um, so that's another consideration. So that's kind of a nice overview of supplementation for the bones and for the calcium, not just the bones, right? Because what's happening in the bones is what we're really talking about is um, we're talking about, when we talk about what's happening in the bones, we're talking about what's happening with um, calcium deposition throughout the body. And um, so, um, and Susan says, uh, taking a lot of vitamin C right now because I have shingles. So I guess that is one positive. Yes. I guess if there's a great positive to come out of shingles, Susan, it would be got me taking a lot of vitamin C. <laughs> um, I hope that goes well. That's uh, that's not pleasant. Shingles never um, email me if you want any other suggestions, but it sounds like you're on top of it. Um, so anyway, uh, we need to do these things. We need to make sure we're getting them. 
um, you know, the adage that, you know, I get everything I need in my food. And um, my doctor tells me I have everything I need in my food, but take your 12 hunt, take your extra vitamin D and, and calcium. Somebody emailed me, I think yesterday um, or the day before a client asking me my opinion on three different calcium supplements. And um, I didn't have time to get back. And I said, I, I would wait until the weekend. I told myself and, um, and, you know, I, now I can just refer her to this program and say, you know, I don't recommend any of them. And this is why. Um, so anyway, I love sharing this information with you. I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope it's helped uh, clear up um, because there are, there's just so many mixed messages among people who are health minded and trying to give good health advice. So there's a lot of times it's like, what do I do? One person says this, one person says that. Well, I think uh, you have to understand that my opinion is the most important. No, <laughs> um, but that this is how I see it and how I see it based on um, the things that I'm studying and reading with regard to these issues and how I am taking care of my own bones. Um, so I would also, I would just say, I think that takes us way past time. I'm at 107, 107. And um, it's time to let you go. So have a great, wonderful weekend, whatever it is you're doing. And I will be back here with you again next week. Take care.